Thank you very much. Uh, it's lovely to be back at uh, the University of Wolverhampton in Stafford. Uh, even though we're not physically present, uh, it, it's nice to be doing another event with you guys. So I uh, really appreciate you asking me. Um, <clears throat> my name's uh, Rob. My name's Rob Francis, and I'm one of the uh, lecturers in creative and professional writing at the University of Wolverhampton. Um, I'm a poet and a writer. Uh, and um, at the moment, <clears throat> I'm the poet in residence for the Black Country Geological Society, which is a great pleasure and privilege for me, um, particularly in this year, as the uh, Black Country Geopark has recently been awarded UNESCO status as a site, uh, well, a series of sites of uh, scientific and geological importance, uh, which is a great boost to the to the West Midlands generally and our, our local area, um, and uh, testament to the amount of work that they've done over the last few years of encouraging sort of sustainable and ecological tourism of uh, promoting uh, the earth sciences and geology to people that may not have previously uh, known about it or uh, known that they were uh, interested in it. Um, and my role as the, the poet in residence for the Black Country Geological Society is to run events like this and talk you through some of my ideas and run some uh, writing workshops and I'm hoping that you guys will uh, contribute this evening to some writing as well uh, but there's no pressure um, and also to kind of write my own responses to the geological heritage that's within the black country um, and I spend quite a lot of time thinking about the ways in which the lay of the land and the makeup of the land uh, is responsible for the uh, sense of place that we have in the region as well. <clears throat> and you can extrapolate some of these ideas and put them into a kind of Staffordshire context or a wider West Midlands context and indeed in a, in a wider UK post-industrial context as well. Since most of the, um, most of the, the regions and areas that were so important during the industrial revolution and remained important throughout uh, the 20th century with their steel works, glass works, chain works, et cetera, <clears throat> tend to be on sites of uh, great geological uh, feats and, um, and beauty as well. Um, and these are the kind of big ideas that I'm sort of playing with and the ideas that I want to introduce to you with this talk. Uh, before I do this, what I would like to invite you all to do is to take, take part in a bit of a writing exercise with me. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a writing warm up to start us off. Then I'm gonna give uh, my talk uh, and give you some uh, information about what I'm up to and what, where these ideas are leading. Um, and then we'll finish with another little writing exercise uh, that'll bring the two things together. Uh, and please, if you write anything that you're particularly pleased with, then please get in touch with me. I'll be very happy to share it on my blog um, uh, or, or even any thoughts that you've got about the talk or writing in this way. Because um, what I'm going to do is introduce you to some ideas known as geopoetics. <clears throat> so that's what the writing is going to be about. So this is what I want you to do to start off with. What I want you to do is just think of your favourite green space. And this can be a park, a woodland, a nature reserve, uh, a lake, uh, the seaside, anywhere that's kind of got that sort of wild natural element to it. And then what we're going to do, and it, it would help mainly if it's somewhere that you know fairly well, or somewhere that you can kind of picture in your mind's eye, 
uh, easily. And what I want you to do is just make a word list to begin with. And a word list of three of these following things. So, and, and these things that you associate with this place as well. So three senses that you associate with it. So sights, smells, tastes, touches, uh, sounds. <clears throat> Any three senses that you can think of. Then I want you to write three moods or emotions or maybe memories that you associate with this place. Then I want you to list three things that you find in this place. So things that you see and, and, and see uh, and that you can find in, in this uh, location. And then finally, three things that you would find or might find underneath your feet or in the ground. So you should then have a list of 12 words. <clears throat> and as I'm going through this talk, you can add to the list, you can think about the connections between the words, you can think about the connections in theme or just the kind of sonic qualities of the words as well. And then we'll revisit this list as we come back uh, at the end and build it into a sort of list poem. So let me crack on with some of my ideas. So as I said, I'm the poet in residence for the Black Country Geological uh, Society. The Black Country, for those that don't know, is a, an area of the West Midlands that's uh, just to the west of Birmingham that is predominantly known for its part in the industrial heritage, uh, in, in the industrial revolution, um, and uh, covers towns like Wolverhampton, Dudley, Walsall, Cradley Heath, uh, and Stourbridge, um, amongst others, although much of the black country uh, in terms of its uh, boundaries is up for debate. Uh, in fact, not even anybody from the black country can really 100% agree on where it begins and ends. So I sort of see this region as a kind of marginal, in-between and borderless place. Um, because we don't know where it begins and ends, because it's so much of the sort of um, identity of the place is tied up with things of the past. Uh, and, and so much of that is now kind of uh, laid to waste or uh, built over. But that said, there is a great sense of pride in the region for its part in uh, the Industrial Revolution. And indeed, it was a kind of one of the main hubs and was known as the cradle of the revolu uh, industrial revolution because of the mines, because of the uh, glass works, chain makers, nail makers and steel workers. Um, all of which have a deep, deep and primal indebtedness to the grounds that allowed that to take place. <clears throat> so, why do I see my region, the place that I grew up and still live, as this kind of in-between or liminal location? Well, for me, I think it's a, we've got this sort of strange mix of green space and grey space. We're not quite rural and we're not quite urban. There's a weird mix of the two. Uh, we're a strange mix of ruined and renovated especially when you consider that so much of the sense of self and sense of place is attached to the industrial heritage. The only thing that remains of that heritage are the kind of hauntings of it in many ways. So we're also this strange mix of new and old as well. And this kind of manifests itself in odd locations and uh, genius loci or spirit of place that is somewhere between homely and unhomely, somewhere between safe and unsafe, somewhere between attractive and repulsive, uh, somewhere between wholesome and uh, nefarious. Uh, and you see that uh, in 
the sites within the region of geological significance, um, as well as the general makeup of the place, but in particular, these different geo sites. Uh, places like Saltwells Nature Reserve, Wren's Nest Nature Reserve, Sedgley Beacon, West Park in Wolverhampton are sites where nature has taken back the old mines and the old quarries. So there are these beautiful places of flora and fauna and protected species of plant and insects. Um, but they still hold the remains of this industrial heritage, this weird and eerie ruins of uh, bell pits that used to open up into great big caverns, of uh, quarries, like I say, and uh, old kind of Victorian bridges and walls that no longer lead us anywhere. Um, so all of this kind of causes us to be sort of in between, in a sense. Um, and of course, these geosites uh, are also rich havens of geological wonder, from chain coral to fossils, uh, to wonderful dipping sequences, uh, where we can tell the movement and the changes in time space by uh, the, the simple observations of the changes of colour in rock and the changes in uh, the, the lines in the rock as well. And all of this gave rise to uh, the, the, in, the industry that was so important here as well. Without the coal seam, you wouldn't have had the mines. Without the limestone, uh, we wouldn't have had such a, an important... Uh, the, the important discovery of uh, smelting and uh, new engineering feats of uh, producing metalwork as well. <clears throat> so let me get sort of theoretical with you for a few seconds as well. Um, one of my other interests and areas of expertise is the field of study known as environmental psychology. Now, environmental psychology is a, a field of study that uh, is interdisciplinary. It's, it covers philosophy, geography, social sciences, creative endeavors, uh, English, all of those. <coughs> but the focus being on uh, the interplay and the clashes and connections and the interface between people and their locales. And a really important figure in environmental psychology was a man called Harold Pashansky, uh, who came up with the term place identity. And this is what he said as a kind of definition of place identity. He called it a substructure of self-identity consisting of memories, ideas, feelings, attitudes, values, preferences, meanings and conceptions of behavior and experience that occur in places that satisfy an individual's biological, psychological, social and cultural needs. So place identity are, is all of the things that we kind of build into ourself that are place specific. And this becomes a really important marker of our sense of self and our sense of self within a place as well. And the environmental psychologists have taken this idea and kind of run with it producing lots of really important and uh, fascinating data on this. They suggest on one hand that a place meets a person's needs so they become dependent on it. So when we arrive at a place, we recognize its functional qualities first and then as time moves on, we become dependent on it because of the functional qualities. They move on to say that the longer a person stays in a place, the greater the likelihood of the place being incorporated into our identities. So we become depend, uh, we, we recognize the function, we become dependent because of the function, and then we start to take on these cultural signs and signifiers that sort of get built into our identity structure and our sense of self. 
Um, and these are certain activities and emotions that connect us to a place, our family, our memories, cultural icons, particular buildings, areas of uh, impressive beauty, uh, the ease of getting around, the quality of local schools, all of these things start to build up a sense of pride and attachment. So the environmental psychologists think that we might think of being or our sense of self in terms of a biological organism moving through time and moving through space whereby it accommodates, assimilates and evaluates the social world. And I would add to this as well, the physical world too, and the natural world. They argue that the distinctiveness of a place uh, summarizes a lifestyle and establishes a particular individual or a particular community as having a, a specific type of relationship with their home environments. And that's a, a relationship that is clearly distinct from other relationships. They argue, and the data really backs this up, that place identifications are used to distinguish ourselves from others and that they are as important to our sense of self and our sense of well being as any other social category, like our class genders, sexualities, religions, ethnicities. So they are as important and as fundamental to our sense of self as all of those other social identifiers. And this is where I kind of connect my uh, passion for the environmental psychologists work with my passion for the black country and its geology and industrial heritage uh, and this is where the name of this talk and my wider project uh, comes from the chain the picture uh, on the left is um, an image of chain coral and chain coral is a now extinct form of colonizing coral that uh, where single cells split off, uh, forming these beautiful kind of honeycomb uh, webs and chain link patterns. And this particular coral colonized an area that was to become known as the black country. So right from the word go, I'm taking this kind of poet's eye view of the region and its heritage and seeing that the chain runs and the symbol of the chain runs very very deep in the cultural psyche of the region as well as it running deep within the uh, the grounds the very grounds that gave rise to the communities and so you can start to think of these as uh, you can start to think of these webs and these meshes and these chain links as the different elements that build up place identity as well. So the grounds mirror and give rise to the industry that allowed for housing estates, uh, which featured working men's clubs and pubs and social clubs and religious buildings and cultural uh, activities uh, that all get connected up together in this kind of beautiful uh, chain coral like substance. <clears throat> and this is what really has, has led me to uh, start to investigate the, the Black Country Geopark as well. Uh, the images you see on the screen here are taken uh, just a few minutes away from my house uh wren's nest in dudley uh the image on the left you can see the uh, housing estate in the background um is an image of uh the the sort of cliffs and the the, the limestone rock formations here um that 
420 million years ago were a tropical ocean during the Silurian era. And I'm not overestimating or exaggerating this in any way. If you walk around this area of the Wren's Nest Nature Reserve for more than 10 minutes, uh, you would be very, very unlucky not to find some kind of fossil because this area is absolutely chocked full of Silurian fossils. Uh, and they're a wonder uh, to behold, especially when you consider that they're only uh, five minutes away from a council estate. Uh, the image on the left is just around the corner from these cliffs and you can just about make out on the, uh, the image where, uh, the, where we can tell where the ocean has cut into the rock. And it's almost, it, it's an image uh, not dissimilar to uh, a beach as the tide pulls out and leaves its ripples. And these are the wren's nest ripple beds. Um, and, and much like many of the other sites in the region uh, and, and within the wider geopark project, the, the network of geo sites in the black country, um, you've got this kind of geological wonder right on your doorstep and right on the doorstep and on the edge of our everyday, of our mundane day-to-day -day, uh, domestic sphere. And, and this fascinates me further because I think what, what walking in the natural realm can do uh, is connect you in a very profound way to your own locales geography and to uh, a, an ecological interconnectedness that all species share on this planet. Um, as well as the kind of industrial connections uh, as well. And I think when you then start to delve into the geological uh, method of looking and the geological uh, interest that's just below the surface, you really start to stumble, or at least I have, on... Um, a sense of atavism and a sense of the primal past. There is something akin to ideas of the sublime in a romantic and gothic sense, a sense of being awestruck and filled of both joy and terror at recognizing humanity's toddlerdom on earth and also in recognizing um the the beautiful uh organized poetic patterns that have come millennia before us and allowed us to uh be such a profoundly successful cultural species um, and that, as I say, is something quite profound, scary and joyful that only ever a few me only ever uh, a few minutes away from where we live in the black country. And indeed, in other post industrial towns and sites across the UK and Staffordshire, too, uh, we're only within a short drive or a short walk of these feelings and these connections of both our industrial pasts and of our primal uh, past as well. And I, I kind of see this because you've, you, you go there and feel it and touch it and pick up the rocks and hold fossils in your hand. This becomes not just a, a an academic game or a, or a, a thought experiment. This, this becomes like ancient wayfinding skills, a form of embodied 
knowledge, I think. And as this is uh, the University of Wolverhampton in Stafford, I thought I would give you a quick reminder of just the, a few of the things that are on Stafford's doorstep as well. Um, I will give extra house points to uh, people that can name some of these. Um, but quite simply, you know, we are within such a short distance away from these uh, ancient primal wonders uh, that hold uh, really interesting <clears throat> and really fascinating links <clears throat> to our pasts that can really help, I think, um, really help with that spirit of place that the environmental psychologists have uh, marked out as so important to our well-being and to our sense of identity. Um, two, um, it is an embodied knowledge that connects us to both the topography and the, geo uh, the geography of the land, and, and because of that, through the earth sciences uh, into our own sort of uh, human pasts as well, but also into our kind of cultural legacy and uh, allows us to consider our time spaces and our locales and our sense of self within that place on very physical uh, and, and robust ways. Um, there are many writers that have inspired my work and, and my thinking around this, but few so more, uh, few uh, have, have touched uh as as deeply i think as as the man pictured here who is kenneth white uh and especially in terms of his ideas uh around geopoetics i said this talk was going to be about geopoetics didn't i um so geopoetics are a form of experimental uh writing but more than that, they're a kind of philosophical way of seeing the world as well uh, that focuses on uh, using the earth sciences, using geology and focusing very intently on the minutiae of our locales with a grounding and grounding exactly the right word there uh, in our sense of awe of the natural world uh, and thinking and writing that is specific to the earth. Now, what Kenneth White as said amongst many other things that have really hit home for me is that when we go outside when we take these sorts of walks that take us to these sorts of beauty spots that really connect us in a profound way to the earth's history and our own histories we achieve what he called a topological or a topographical reverie or a topological presence is the term he used and I kind of see this in the same terms as I've just described in that romantic tradition of feeling awestruck by the sublime nature that's right under our feet, that's right on our hills, that's right on our everydays. And this topological reverie <clears throat> that is brought about by entering these places and being acutely aware of our observations while we're there brings about sort of deep time thinking and deep time vantage point because not only are we thinking about ourselves within our locales not only are we thinking about our identities as communities within our locales we're thinking about them in the context of uh millions and million well hundreds of millions of years 
of rock shifts, climate changes, uh, ecological upheavals, peaks and troughs. So we get this sort of deep time understanding of our places as well through this sort of geopoetic traveling. Uh, and because of the uh, because of this, we start to comprehend, and that might be an intellectual comprehension, and it might be a more physical or visceral, guttural uh, comprehension about the minutiae of our locales, <clears throat> which further embeds that local knowledge and that wider deep time knowledge as well. And the final thing that uh, Kenneth White put forth, uh, or, or that I'm going to sort of summarise here, uh, he's, he's written much more uh, than I could do justice to in one lecture, uh, let alone one slide, <clears throat> um, is that part of this topological reverie, this deep time thinking, this moving around our locales, and he was very adamant about this, that when we when we start out on this topographical uh, journey, on this geopoetic journey, we should start from our own doorsteps. Uh, one of the jokes that he made at a recent conference was uh, people know their addresses, but they don't know where they live. Um, and so starting with your own locale and widening the circle incrementally um, until you reach that sort of... Uh, wider understanding <clears throat> is what he kind of set out as a practical geopoetic advice <clears throat> and once we've kind of got there white suggests uh, we need to figure out new ways of seeing and most importantly new ways of recording this place through embodied understanding um, and so in part this is a joining together of the environment uh, of the ecological and the geological and those scientific vernaculars and languages and methods with our everyday uh, dialects and languages and conversational uh, words uh, forming within that a sort of new poetic conjugation. Um, so as much as it is about this kind of walking into wonder or walking out of ourselves into our locales, uh, we are mining for words and mining for poetic method as well. And the method in my case is that idea of uh, the chain coral as metaphor. And this is an example of the kind of thing that I've played with in this. So I'm gonna finish my talk with this poem here called Through Filth. And this uh, poem is uh, dedicated and written about the Dudley Tunnel uh, and the Dudley and Canal Trust uh, and the people that volunteer and work there, as well as the so hopefully this will take you not only in underground into Dudley and into its canals and caverns, but also uh, into the industrial past, into the mythic past, and into the geological past. Through filth. Attend, descend with me mucker, down below grounds of Pagnell's Priory, Ear rides the rhizome echo of Cluniac monks and their prayer, enkindled, inflamed, like our own smithy's scorched core to gem, sand to glass, dust to daggers, smelt by quicksilver fingers and nail mecking kins full of ken for our caverns. These caverns descend with me, mucker, descend down below Renner roots and lime where the cut chain links Nidhog, Yggdrasil the corner shop, call centre, from chain coral helixing revelations to brackets, a battle, ghost ship, colony, empires of Iverin and Ovrin here, 
sending out canting wisps of caggy-headed scrappies older than gob time. Attend, moist ore moves in slow spit-splitting fermi, firm as fossil, cold as core. There are a spedberg of scuttles in here, just patient sediments with a brood of halcyte, silica shale, tracks of tabulite ordering roots for proto-beans and proto-action. Down here, when the stone and slick sand fertilizers for stealer, glass maker, almost teen lad with armor, with chisel, with lens to spy crinoid ruins, insect set in geo nest, attend. Here rests the Dudley bug, Moloch. It's our slow burn municipal crest. Electra protects brave chests in protean soils and lets us swarm in stercore in Veneta. Thank you very much for listening and I uh, hope everybody's enjoyed that. We'll make some time uh, in a moment for uh, a bit of a Q&A if people have got questions. But before I go, I would like you to uh, indulge me for one final writing exercise. So using the word list that we uh, discussed at the beginning of this uh, talk, we're going to write a chinquain. And what I want you to do is lay it out uh, as is listed on this slide. So it's only a very short poem. Uh, it's only five lines long. And we're going to work it as it's a form of kind of imagist poetry where the images do the talking for themselves. Uh, so line one needs to be one word. So it's just one word long, one word from your list of senses. So pick your favorite sense and write that down as line one. Line two needs to be two words long and this needs to be two words from the list of things that you find in this particular place that you've uh, brought to mind. So two words from things that you find in that place. Line three needs to be three words from your list of things that are below the feet and in the ground. And line four, I want you to write a four word sentence that describes one of the moods or emotions that you've written down. So slight change on line four, rather than just a list of words, I want it to be a four word sentence that describes or sets out that mood or emotion. And then finally, line five is an alternative word or a synonym for that very first word that you listed, uh, that very first line so a different word for your sense. So let me just go through that one more time. So line one is uh, one word from a sense. Line two is two things that you find in the place. Line three is three things that you find below the surface. Line four is a four word sentence that describes or sets out a mood or an emotion that you uh, associate with this place. And then finally, an alternative word for that first sensory word. And like I say, I'd really like you to play with this if you, if you, if it, the spirit takes you and please do get in touch if you've got anything you want to share. Um, and uh, I would like to feature people's work and people's ideas on my blog as a kind of uh, extra, extra chain link to the project. So 